we've talked about log likelihood for our statistics tools, and now it's time to bring that over to our classifier side. So fundamentally what we're doing is using this log likelihood function as a means of talking about how well a classifier is performing. In our statistics tools, we were estimating the parameters mean and standard deviation of a normal distribution given a set of data. We really only had one notion of class there. It was the data that we sampled from the distribution. And the, the new twist here is that now we have two classes. So we have a, a positive class, samples from a positive class, we have samples from a negative class. And what we want our classifier to be doing is assigning high probabilities to the ones that are truly in the positive class and low probabilities to the samples that are in the negative class. So we've got to get that math right. So with our statistics example, we had likelihood defined as the product of all of our individual likelihoods. And now what we're going to do is define likelihood not for this one class, but now we have a likelihood for a set of positives and for negatives. Because these are independently drawn samples, we're going to make that assumption. And part of making this work well is to make sure in our data collection process that this is nominally true. We're going to make this assumption that these are independent samples. So that allows us to compute a product over all of the probabilities for the individual elements. And then that gives us a likelihood for the entire data set. So for the positive class, so I'm going to change up the notation just a little bit. So for J's that are in the positive class, I'm going to compute the product over all of the probabilities that are being generated by our function. So this handles the positive side, but we also have the negative side to worry about. And it's this initial product on the left-hand side that's, that's going to be multiplied by the product of all of the elements that are in the negative class. If we just did this, then this wouldn't really capture our notion that for truly negative items, our answer should be low. If we just left it as is, our classifier would want to assign high Ys to these negative elements. And the way to get around this is to actually invert this. So we have one minus Yj hat. So if our classifier is doing the right thing for negative elements, it's answering a low value. And what that means is that that difference then is something close to one. So the ideal classifier will assign all of these elements over here to something close to one. It'll assign all of these elements something close to zero, which means that the inversion then is something close to one. And then if we then compute the product of all of these things, then we have a value. If they're really near one, then our values of the entire product is going to be something approximating one. So that's the intuition of our likelihood function. Of course, as we've already talked about, the likelihood function as m gets big, it tends toward zero anyway. So even if I have a 0.99 and I multiply a bunch of those together, that eventually is going to tend toward zero as that number of elements becomes large. So really what we want to do is compute the log uh, likelihood. And this is equal to our sum over our positive elements. And this is now log of yj hat. And that's added to the sum over all of our negative elements. And this is our log of 1 minus yj hat. It's convenient to be able to collapse these two sums down to a, a single sum. And the trick we're going to use here is that for, for the positive cases, we're going to assign yj to 1. And for negative cases, we're going to assign yj to a 0. And so let me rewrite this log likelihood function now. And I'll, I'll start with keeping these things separate here. So if I say, if I put a yj in here, log yj hat, for all of these positive cases, yj is going to be equal to 1. So I haven't 
made a change to the left hand side here. And for the right hand side, where j is in the negative class, if I write one minus yj here, I haven't changed the, the meaning of what we had up here. Because one minus yj for the negative cases, that's always going to be one. So I've just inserted a, a one in, into this product. So it doesn't change the value. Now the, the observation is that if I, for example, happen to assign accidentally a positive case to this right-hand side, I accidentally assigned it a negative to this uh, sum on the, the right-hand side, then yj I'm going to assume is one here. And what that means is that this difference then is zero. So if I actually placed a positive into this full sum here, it's not actually going to change the, the notion of what is in that sum. So, so what that means is I can change my sum to be all of my j's. So now j is going to go from zero to n minus one, and it's yj log yj hat plus the other side. So for positive cases, this yj is one, and then this one minus yj is zero. So that particular element of the sum is completely determined by this log yj hat. And if I have a negative example, yj is going to be zero. So that means this term will, will be zero. And this term here will be one. And so the contribution to the sum is just this log one minus yj hat. So hopefully what this does is it convinces you that this particular formulation here of, of log likelihood is actually the same as what we had up here. It's a little bit more complicated, but what's nice about it is that it has a single sum within it. Now when we start talking about, say, the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to our parameter, some, some parameter w uh, big I, we're going to have another a term within this uh, derivative that asks us about the derivative of this with respect to a wi. But what's key is what is the derivative of log likelihood as we make changes to yj hat. The key thing to note is that these yj's are constants. So those terms will ultimately effectively drop out. And what's, what's important is just what is the derivative of this log yj hat or the log of one minus yj hat. So let's, let's take a quick look at what that looks like. So along the horizontal, we have uh, yj hat. And first off, what we're going to do is plot a log of yj hat on the vertical axis here. So this horizontal line corresponds to zero. And log of yj hat is going to cross zero at one. And remember that one is our maximum possible value for, for yj hat, given our sigmoid. So really what happens to the right-hand side of this one really doesn't matter. And it's also the case that the value that we get is also yj hat will never be lower than zero. So really the important stuff that's going on sits within this zero to one range. What the shape of this is, we sort of cross one at this point here. This log of yj hat crosses one along here. The slope is actually one right at that point. And then as yj approaches zero, we, we start to get, we start to move down faster and faster and faster. In fact, when yj hat is exactly zero, our, our log yj hat approaches negative infinity. Likewise, if we want to look at log of one minus yj hat, the, it's just the mirror image of this curve. So it crosses the origin with a slope of one. And as we approach one, as yj hat approaches one, then, then this curve uh, approaches negative infinity again. All right, so the, the key observation here is that looking at either the purple or the, the red curve, Anywhere that we drop onto, so we can drop onto here, the slope here is something interesting. 
and it's greater than zero. In fact, it's far away from zero. The slope of one, slope is, is one as we cross there. And as we head down this curve, as y j hat gets uh, smaller and smaller, the, the slope increases. And, and in fact, it approaches in infinity as we approach zero. So the key here is that the derivative for log y j hat for the range that we're interested in is never sitting at zero and it's far away from zero. The other, the other side for log uh, one minus yj hat, this has the same property. So here our slope is, is negative one. Let's choose a different color here. Slope is negative one. Uh, and as we head down this curve, this, this slope is getting larger and larger in, in magnitude. So again, derivative is always something interesting and far away from zero. So what this ultimately means is that we don't get into the same problem that we had with mean squared error, where our derivative becomes uh, zero in situations where we have a very big error. In fact, our, our error is so big that uh, we're answering a completely incorrect side relative to where we actually want to be. Uh, with, with that mean squared error over the sigmoid, we were stuck with this situation where that derivative was arbitrarily close to zero and we were in a situation where we couldn't actually repair the, the problem with our uh, function that we were trying to learn. But here, this problem actually does not occur. All right, so that's, that's the intuition behind this log likelihood cost function that, that we use for logistic regression and, and it comes up in a variety of other scenarios as well. Next up, we're going to actually try some logistic regression.